Good morning. It got kind of quiet, so I guess that was my cue. So, uh, Good to have everybody here today. Appreciate everyone that's here today with us. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we also definitely appreciate that. You are our special guests, and if you are looking for a church home, we definitely appreciate you uh, visiting with us today as well, and we would love to uh, love if you could stick around and we get to know you a little bit and you get to know us. Before we begin, if you would turn in your Bibles to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 12th chapter is where I'll be reading from in just a minute. I do have a couple quick announcements I'd like to make mention of before we begin. Um, our first announcement is we'd like to, uh, we would like to uh, send out our prayers for uh, Miss Judy Peterson, who will be having a procedure tomorrow. Uh, to receive a uh, pain stimulator and then also we would like to uh, keep uh, those in our prayers this week who are uh, attending the Short Mountain Bible Camp this week so we'd like to keep in our prayers for them for their safe return as well. Last day is the last day to contribute to the back to school bash. If you need any more information on that please see Mr. Andy Mitchell or uh, Miss Cindy Pfeiffer. MYM is at the uh, New Union Church of Christ in Readable this coming Monday at 7 p.m. And if, again, if you wish to carpool, if you do not have a ride to that, you are more than welcome to meet in this parking lot here at 615, and there should be somebody here who can give you a ride. Um, also, there will be an elders, deacons, and ministers meeting this, um, yes, this Wednesday, July the 20th, uh, immediately following in the room, the back room 101. Um, you are invited to the wedding of Holly Bowman and Jonah May here on Saturday the 23rd, this coming Saturday, at 2.30 p.m., a reception is to follow. And then we have several, several sign-up sheets in the back, so I'm just going to kind of hit these on a rapid-fire note. Um, if, you, if you want to sign up for anything, there is a uh, table that is in the back foyer. Uh, we do have a dinner and devotional for the youth night immediately following the p.m. service at the home of Eddie and Annette Sanders. Then also the youth devotional for July the 28th at Mia's house and myself's house. And then there's a summer celebration at the Go USA Fun Park for all ages. That is July the 30th at 2 p.m. And then there's a fun day on the Scales Farm that's coming up on August the 20th at 10.30 a.m. And this is also a fun for all ages type event. Again, I kind of rapid fired through that list, but there is a lot to do here at this church, uh, and if you have any questions or anything, uh, like I said, see the foyer, so there's a sign-up list for it. If you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in the first verse, and it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with the endurance of the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that has set before him, endured the cross, despite the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endures such hostility from sinners like against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your own souls. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for this time that you've allowed us to gather together on this first day of the week to sing songs of praises to you, to study another portion with your word. We say that everything we say and done here today will be in accordance with your will. Father, we pray for those who are sick and those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you'll look down upon them, give them your guidance and put your hand out over them and give them the comfort and strength that only you can. Go with us, Father, as we continue about this service. These prayers we ask in your son's name. Amen. First song this morning will be song 664, There Stands a Rock. Let's stand if you would, please. <clears throat> There's a rock on shores of time that is to help me say so blind. That rock is set and they are blessed to find me in the set of rest. Some build their homes, some the ever-breaking sand, some on the grave for the treasure of their land. 
possessing faithful love. in prayer we'll sing break my heart We pray together. Our Father, as we come before you this morning, we praise your high and holy name. We give you thanks for our being, for all things, Father. Father, as we come before you, we are mindful of those, especially of our number, who are sick. 
those who are needing doctor's services, those who are preparing for tests, those who are grieving, those who are downhearted, those who are discouraged. Father, we pray for each one. We pray, Father, that each need would be met, that there would be healing, that there would be peace, and that there would be comfort. Father, as a group of your people, I pray now that we would look to be encouragers, that we would look for opportunity to serve, that we would find those opportunities to be engaged with one another, to build one another up. And Father, that by being together this morning, by praising your name in song, by lifting up our petitions to you in prayer, and by hearing your word as it's preached. I pray, Father, that we would be encouraged, that we would be built up in the most holy faith, that we might serve you in this community, and that we might have the zeal and the desire to spread the good news of your Son as we go from day to day. Father, we're so thankful for those who serve in leadership here. We're thankful for their desire to lead this congregation. And Father, I pray that you would help us to encourage them, that we would build them up, and that they would see our desire to serve as they lead us. Father, I'm thankful for our ministers that each first day of the week that they are prepared to come before us and to speak boldly about your word, to encourage us, to convict us through the writings and teachings of your inspired word. Father, we're mindful of our country and all the things that we could for hours talk about that we wish were different. But I'm thankful, Father, and praise your name that we are citizens of another country, your kingdom. And Father, that if we will stay true to your kingdom, the things around us, when it's all said and done, will make no difference. Father, I pray that as we strive together to serve you, that we would lift your name up each and every day that our example would be true according to your word. And Father, that we would be motivated to bring others to know you through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I pray, and amen. <clears throat> Sing song number 929, glorify your name.
be the song before, or after the lesson, 389. And then before the lesson, 829, Mansions Over a Hilltop. Let's stand, if you would, please, again. I'm satisfied with Good morning. Welcome all of you to Salem Creek this morning. Thanks for being here. We have visitors with us today. We're grateful for your presence and we invite you back anytime you have the opportunity. Make an opportunity to come back and uh, if you're looking for a church home, we want to talk to you about this great congregation here at Salem Creek. I want to encourage all of you to come back tonight at 530. Uh, what we're going to do is clear this big hunk of wood out of the way. We're going to have three chairs up here and Brother Eddie Sanders, Brother Joshua and I are going to have a conversation and it's going to be about what is a very important topic and we have focused on the one that the topic we want to talk about tonight uh, as a result of some conversations with, uh, with somebody. But we're going to be talking about the quest for validation. Where do we seek validation as human beings? And I think that will be a very interesting conversation. At least I hope that uh, it will be that way. Our text today comes from the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And as a lead in to that text, I want to go back to chapter 11. Chapter 11 and that great statement about God's faithful people of a prior generation wasn't intended to be read in a vacuum. It's part of a context. And it leads into what we read in chapter 12 in the beginning. I want to start at verse 32 where he says, What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in goatskins and sheepskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. All these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And then he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that does so easily beset us. Immediately following the passage that Rob read this morning, you have verse 4, where he told those people perhaps about something that was to come in the not too distant future. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Now being a preacher and being a man and having the famous notorious male ego, I like to be able to answer people's questions. Somebody comes up to me after services, I, I love to be able to answer questions that they might bring. I I'm not always able to do that. Very early in my career preaching the gospel of Christ in a small town in Alabama. Somebody came up to me after a Wednesday night Bible study and they had a question. I don't remember what the question was. It was one of the Bible's very difficult questions and was one of those, just quite frankly, if I'm going to be honest, I'm going to have to say, I don't really know the answer to that question. Somebody standing right beside this person who asked the question was a, a very big fan of the preacher who had preceded me. And she just went right straight into a statement that assured this lady who asked the question she could an answer. She says, I'll just call, she named the previous preacher, and I'll call him and ask him. Now, how do you think that made me feel in that situation? Well, when you read the book of Hebrews, and when you teach the book of Hebrews, there are some questions about which you really just have to say we don't know. If you teach a class in the book of Hebrews, what is the first question everybody wants to know or wants answered? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? And I've sat in classes in Hebrews at the university level, at the graduate school level, and you always go through all of this time early on in those classes talking about who wrote the book of Hebrews. Was it Paul? Was it Apollos? Was it Priscilla? Was it a whole host of other people? And when all is said and done, guess what the answer is? We just don't know. So in recent years when I've taught the book of Hebrews, I have spent very little time talking about who wrote the book of Hebrews because when we get through with all of the possible options, we're left saying we really don't know. To whom was it written? Well, it was written to the Hebrews. But who were the Hebrews? And where were they? In other words, what's the destination of this letter? And again, that's another one of those questions you explore if you're studying Hebrews at the university level or the graduate school level. Was it written to Christians in Alexandria? Was it written to Christians in Spain? Was it written to Christians in Judea? And Neil Lightfoot in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, which he put out way back in 1975, he came to say this, that thinking nowadays, and that's back in 1975, has narrowed it down to two destinations, Jerusalem and Rome. Well, I could throw all of that information out there, and guess what? When all is said and done, I have to say, I don't really know what the ultimate destination of the book of Hebrews was. I thank God that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit and that it is included in our Scripture. But when you look at the book of Hebrews, there's a lot that you do know. 
It was written to some Christians who may very well have grown tired in their service to God. Chapter 10 and verse 36, right before that great statement about all of these faithful people of God, says you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive that which is promised. That may very well be an indication. Here were some people who were spiritually tired. It was written to some people, if you read chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, who have already in their service to God paid a very high price for their commitment to Christ. He talked about the persecutions that they had suffered and things I, I would never want to experience. And when you read chapter 12 and verse 4, what you may be reading is an indication that for them the worst was yet to come. You have not yet you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And so those are a few things we can know about the people who first read this tremendous statement about Jesus Christ. What can we know about the book of Hebrews? One of the most important things that's pointed out in this great book is that God speaks. This book begins by telling us about how God speaks to his people, his people with these words. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. We go on and read chapter 2 in the first four verses. He makes this very clear and decisive point. We need to pay particular attention to the things that we have heard. Looking back to the previous covenant, he says, If every transgression and disobedience receive a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? Who have those of us who have received such a great salvation? It's interesting to me. That a great emphasis given here to the gospel message, the inspired word of God. You come to chapter 3 and verse 7, and you read some words. Some people would read and, and put the period right here, therefore just as the Holy Spirit says. And they'd lift that totally out of context and say, look here, the Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I've heard people preach sermons about, quote, how to listen to the Holy Spirit. You've heard those types of sermons. I just give you one piece of advice. Let them go in one ear and out the other. When you read the book of Hebrews in chapter 3 and verse 7, the Holy Spirit says, do you know what the very next thing is that you read in that passage? A quotation of the Word of God, right? Right? And he quotes Psalm 95. Ron, are you saying the Holy Spirit doesn't speak today? Absolutely not. He speaks very powerfully today. How does he do that? Through the message given to us through inspired people who were the authors of Scripture. And that is a very powerful statement. And we need to be listening to what the message of the Son is as presented in Scripture. Now this passage we're looking at today is about something I believe is very important. And that is the business of running this race that we began when we started down the path of commitment to Jesus Christ. And as you listen to what the Bible has to say to us this morning, I would strongly encourage all of us to question some things. I'm not talking about questioning the church. I'm not talking about questioning Scripture. I'm talking about our own personal commitment to Jesus Christ. We've started this race. Do we have the commitment to see it through to the end? Are we humble enough to say, Lord, I'm going to depend upon you to carry me through as I run this race and help me to cross the finish line so that I'm with you through all eternity. Three simple points this morning. The first of those is, if we're going to run this race, we've got to get ready to run the race. Look back to chapter 12 and verse 1, if you will, where he says, Therefore, 
since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Two things he talks about there that we have to lay aside, and that's the preparation for running the race. We have to lay aside every encumbrance. The King James Version there says every weight. We have to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us. Well, what is an encumbrance? An encumbrance is simply a weight, bulk, a burden, or an impediment. You think about trying to run a race with something strapped to your back, and by the way, that is not a strange concept as it may sound. In the wide world of horse racing, there are what would be known as handicap races. That's an interesting thing. What do you mean by a handicap race? Well, in handicap races, and, and by the way, the triple crown here in the United States, none of those are handicap races, but when you have a handicap race, like the Melbourne Cup, the most prestigious horse race in Australia, folks in Australia and New Zealand are absolutely crazy about horse racing, but in the Melbourne Cup, their most prestigious race, that's a handicap race. You take the fastest horses, and you put additional weight on those fastest horses. They're very famous uh, New Zealand bred horse, race horse by the name of Farlap, who ran in the first half of the 20th century. He won the Melbourne Cup on one occasion, carrying 138 pounds in addition to the saddle and the jockey who was riding him. And by the way, he comes in ranked number 22 out of the greatest racehorses of the 20th century. Now, that's an illustration of what we're talking about here, the encumbrance, or as the King James Version says, the weight. You imagine running a race like that with a great weight fastened to your body. The Bible says, lay it aside. And the sin that so easily entangles us, I remember... A cold night in April, Tuesday night, April the 4th, 19, <coughs> excuse me, when I was a senior in high school, running in the Berry Relays over on the good side of the tracks. In Birmingham, Alabama, on the 4th of April, in that particular year, it was 32 degrees and snowing. You know where Ron wants to be when it's 32 degrees and snowing? I want to be inside where it is warm and cozy. You know I don't like cold unless we're talking about a drink. Come time to run, I'm sitting up there in those bleachers, in that, uh, those cold metal bleachers in that football stadium, snow coming down all around us. In my warm-up suit, a pair of sweatpants and a sweatshirt with minor tigers emblazoned on the, on, the, on the front of it, come time to run, well, I've got my flimsy track suit on underneath that, which is paper thin uh, to make it easier to run. I've got a decision to make. Do I peel that warm-up suit off, run in my track suit, or do I run that race with that impediment? hindering me, getting me tangled up. I looked at my competitors, I realized they're, because I'd run against them all of my career, I, there's no way I can beat those fellows. Tonight, I'm choosing comfort. And so I kept that impediment. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that does so easily entangle us. Brothers and sisters, in that verse, we have a serious challenge. I am very, very concerned today as a Christian to hear how some people want to downgrade the discipline that is required to run this race, to live the Christian life. Let me remind all, all of us that the Bible repeatedly stresses the need for repentance. 
The repentance that is required as we come to Christ, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me remind every one of us about the need for repentance in our walk with Christ in Acts chapter 8 when Philip has gone to Samaria and preached the gospel, there are a lot of converts. And there's this man by the name of Simon who believes he also, he's also baptized. Makes that commitment to Christ. And then the lust for fame got a hold of him. Peter and John came down, laid their hands on these people so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They began to manifest that in a miraculous way. And old Simon approached Peter and John. He said, hey, let me give you some money so that you can give that power, that ability to me. And Peter looked him straight in the eye. He didn't mince words. He didn't say, I've got to be careful lest I offend this fellow. He said, your heart's not right with God. You need to repent. You need to pray of this, uh, for the forgiveness of this wickedness if perhaps God might pardon you. And repeatedly throughout Scripture, we're called upon to lay sin aside. And maybe today there is some sin that is entangling you. Maybe it is materialism. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 says, put away covetousness, which is idolatry. Maybe the sin that is burdening you is the sin of anxiety, the sin of worry. Paul has an answer for that in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, where he says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And then that wonderful peace of Christ will guard and keep your life. In the book of Hebrews, contrary to what some people believe, you have warnings in chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 about falling away. You have a warning in chapter 10, verse 26 through 31 about the business of willful sin. In the end result of those in both cases, read the text is that you may forfeit what you have in Christ. Those who are advocates of the idea that you can't fall away will say, yes, that's what the text says, but the author is just making up a straw man. The possibility really doesn't exist. I've never known a biblical writer to build up a straw man about anything. That's not the way they wrote when they gave warnings, those warnings were real and they were to be taken very seriously. And I'm saying to all of us today that we need to get very serious about running this race and the discipline that running that race requires. And so whatever that burden is that has got you weighted down, whatever it is that has you entangled, the writer of this text says you need to lay that aside. Number two, having done that, having gotten ready to run the race, we need to get ourselves refocused on Christ. We need to get our eyes fixed on Jesus, by the way. Where you look is very important. A number of years ago, I made an attempt to coach youth baseball. And one of the things I learned in coaching youth baseball is that the mamas will call you every name in the book, and I'm still wondering why in the world I undertook that. One night we were playing a, a team in what was called the minor leagues, not a 10 year old league. Had a great kid, wonderful kid from a wonderful family playing left field. He had a little bit of problem staying focused. And right next to the field in which we were playing, there was another baseball field. And right there in the middle of our defensive inning, this young man is watching the game on the other field. Now, where's he looking? Well, he's certainly not looking at our pitcher. He's certainly not looking at our batter. And he had no idea that there was a fly ball coming his way. He's standing here like this watching this game on the other field. The ball landed right there two feet from him. My center fielder had to come over, pick up the ball, and throw it back into the infield. Now, try to tell me that where you're looking is not important. 
And I'll tell you, the Bible says you really don't know what you're talking about. And sometimes we pick the wrong one to imitate, and sometimes we're looking in the wrong direction, seeking validation to come back tonight, and we're going to talk about that. But when you're running a race, the direction you look is straight ahead. You don't look back. When you're running a race, and you start looking back, that potentially costs you victory. As you look at verse 2, he says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, he despised the shame. Where is he now? Right now he is seated at the right hand of God. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. That doesn't mean just take a glance at Jesus. What does he mean here when he says, fixing your eyes on Jesus? I'm looking right straight at Christ. I'm staring at him as intently as I possibly can, and I never take my eyes off of Jesus. I pray to God that he'll forgive me and help me in those times in life when I have grown discouraged, when I've grown materialistic, when I've grown worldly minded, when I've been tempted to go back into the world, I've taken my eyes off of Jesus. And I pray that God will forgive me that for that and help me to keep my eyes fixed on him. This is more than just a casual glance. You remember Genesis chapter 19? And God is almost having to grab Lot by the collar and physically drag him away from Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember what God said to Lot and his family as they're getting ready to flee? The Bible tells us that they were told in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 19, don't look back. And you remember what Lot's wife did in verse 26? What'd she do? She looked back. God turned her into a pillar of salt. And later on in the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus used that for an illustration. I believe in that text he's uh, foretelling the coming destruction of Jerusalem. When that time comes, you, you get out of here. Don't try to take anything with you. Don't look back. And he says, then, remember Lot's wife. What did Lot's wife do that absolutely destroyed her? She looked back back. Why'd she look back? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But I can very well imagine we got a house back there. We're all worried about the house, aren't we? I got a house back there. I got friends there. By the way, she probably had way too many friends in Sodom. For whatever reason, she looked back. I don't want to be a good Israelite. What do you mean by that? God's redeemed his people. He's led them out of the land of Egypt, led them out of that horrible place of bondage. And have you ever noticed as you read Exodus, as you read, for example, the book of Numbers, how many times Israel is looking back to Egypt? You go back and read chapter 11 of the book of Numbers, and they start reminiscing on how, they, how good they had it in Egypt. Man, we had all the melons, we had all the leeks, we had all the cucumbers, all the garlic, all the type of stuff. And I don't know why in the world they wanted that stuff. We remember how good we had it in Egypt. Where are they supposed to be looking? They're supposed to be looking to Canaan, right? They're supposed to be looking to God. Get ready to run the race, but get your eyes refocused on Jesus. And I, I'm afraid sometimes that, that we as a church, and sometimes some of us as individuals, we can be taking our eyes off of Jesus. And there's so much I'd like to say about that. We don't have time. I'm kind of like that Hebrew writer in chapter 11. Time would fail me to talk about all of this. But you look at everything the book of Hebrews has to say about Jesus, the author 
and finisher of our faith, the one who originated, the one whom we follow, the one who has brought it to completion, who has perfected it. What does that mean? could mean any number of things. But in Scripture, I find a number of themes that begin very early in Scripture. They're kind of like roadmaps running throughout the Bible. And you can kind of look at that this way in trying to unravel all of those and trying to put them all together. All roads lead to Jesus. All roads in Scripture lead to Christ. You better keep your eyes on Him. Third point this morning. Just be so tenacious, so hard-headed, so stubborn that you absolutely refuse to quit. Look at what he says in verse 3 of chapter 12. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. That is, think about Jesus and everything that he endured. Why, brother author? Verse 3 concludes this way, so that you will not lose heart. So that you will not lose heart. Sometimes I do the dumbest things. Yesterday I went to Mount Juliet and helped our son with his mowing job. He's got a mowing, mowing a daycare. They pay him, I'd like to have the money they pay him to mow the daycare. I went over and helped. I did the trimming for an hour and a half. Guess what? It was Hot yesterday, and I love it. Then last night, the chain in my brain slipped a cog. I texted my daughter, you want to run tonight? Yeah, let's do it after dark. She came over. Well, Dad, how far are we going? I said, let's run four miles tonight after being out in the heat trimming for an hour and a half let's run four miles and we got started and by the way we we ran by my sister-in-law's house my sister-in-law my wife were out there in the driveway they yelled something at us I couldn't hear a word of it we got back to the house found out they were unloading a chair out of the car gonna take it in the house and I think the message I heard was you could stop and help us well, I texted her. I wouldn't have been much help at that point if I had stopped. And if I had stopped, I don't know if I would have ever gotten started running again. She texted me back, oh, I don't know how you run. I'm walking on how you run. I don't know how you run on a night like this. Well, the answer to that is pretty easy. Not easy to execute, but easy to express. It, it, it's a matter of picking one foot up and setting it down in front of the other. Let me tell you, I was very tempted to quit last night. I didn't. There have been a lot of people who have been tempted to quit and turn away from Christ. A whole lot have, but a whole lot have not. Absolutely, once you've started running this race, refuse to quit. And the race is tough. There's nothing in this text that indicates any kind of health and wealth gospel. You read words like endured. You read words like cross. You read words like shame. And then go back and read the text that I read at the beginning, starting in chapter 32 and going through the end of chapter 11. And all of that part of Hebrews chapter 11 is not focused on their great exploits. It's focused on the things that they suffered. And you read about people thrown in prison. You read about the lions. You read about being sawn in two. Take that quite literally. And how many of us would want to suffer something like that for our faith, and yet they did. And how do you persist in the face of all of that kind of difficulty by understanding that the God we serve is far greater than any enemy that we will ever face. And to know him and to know Christ and to know his spirit is far greater 
than any earthly treasure. And so you get ready to run the race. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And whatever happens, refuse to quit. Don't be one of those people who says, if I don't get my way, I'm heading somewhere else. Don't be one of those people who looks at work that is required to carry on the work of the church and say, well, you know what, they're just expecting way too much about me. It isn't about me. It isn't about you. And as, as, as you read this wonderful passage here from Hebrews chapter 12, this is the ultimate expression of what Jesus said about discipleship. If any, any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 is the ultimate expression of that. We take up that cross. We follow Christ. And we keep our eyes on Jesus. And no matter how discouraging life may be, no matter how great the temptations may be that Satan throws at us, we never look back. We never turn back. We keep trusting Him. And we persevere and we run with patience. And you know what that is? That's endurance. We run with patience the race that is set before us. I wonder how many today have never gotten in the race. You can't run it unless you're in it. Did you ever get to the starting line? Did you ever go past the starting line? Hear those people on Pentecost crying out to Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's P hear Peter's answer. Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the starter's gun being fired. You get in the race, you start running the race. Now then you run it with perseverance and if you need to do that, we want to help you with that today. Christian, how many of us have gotten tired? How many of us have gotten discouraged? How many of us have taken our eyes off of Jesus? Maybe you need to come back to him. We want to help you with that. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. It's a difficult life, but it is the greatest life because it leads ultimately to not the best reward. It leads to the only reward. Lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily entangles us, and run that race with patience. Will you come as we stand and sing?
As we focus our thoughts now on the Lord's Supper, we'll sing song number 511. 511. <laughs> Before we begin our <clears throat> communion this morning, does anyone have need of a communion cup? If so, please raise your hand and you'll be delivered one. We live in a society that has memorials everywhere. We unfortunately had a road trip yesterday and along the sides of the road there are memorials for those who for whatever reason have lost their lives and have perished in that particular area. There's flowers, there's other things that are there. We erect monuments in our cemeteries, we have monuments in, uh, in various places throughout our society to remember those who have gone on. In Joshua chapter 3 and Joshua chapter 4 children of Israel crossed the Jordan River to go over into the promised land. And as they crossed that body of water on dry land, Joshua told the children of Israel to select them one man from each of the 12 tribes. And as they crossed, they were to take up a stone from the bottom of the Jordan River so that they, when they got on the other side, they could erect a monument to the event that they were involved with so that when years came, they could tell their children what those stones meant and what they represented. We have an opportunity this morning to do that very same thing to the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of mankind, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And as we take this memorial, we need to remember what he suffered and did for us. And as Ron mentioned in his sermon this morning, he did it willingly. He endured the cross willingly for us that we might have hope of something better than what we have now. Would you bow? Holy Father, we are indeed grateful for the sacrifice that 
your son gave for us, that he was willing to endure the cross, suffer the shame and the pain, so that we, through obedience to you, might have hope of eternal life. As we memorialize this this morning and we remember that sacrifice, help us to take this bread, which is emblematic of his body as he hung on that cross and that as he died for our sins, Father. Forgive us as we fail you and help us to take this in a way that is pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Let us bow again. <clears throat> Likewise, Father, we are so thankful for the shedding of our Savior's blood because we understand that unless there is shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And we're so thankful that he was willing to endure this. And we pray that as we partake of this cup, which is emblematic of the blood that he shed for our sins on the cross, that we can do so as pleasing to you and beneficial to us. In Christ's name, amen. Apart from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity each week to give back to the Lord's cause a portion of those things we have been blessed with. If you have not already done so, there are baskets at the back of the auditorium. As you exit, you may put your contribution there. Let us give thanks. Holy Father, we are indeed grateful for the many wonderful blessings we enjoy in this life for life itself and for the ability to work and earn a living for our families. We pray that as we have opportunity this morning to give back to you from the bounty of your blessings that we will do so in a way that will be pleasing to you, that we will be a cheerful giver and give liberally, that your work may continue. Be with those who oversee these funds that they may do so, so that your work can, can be spread throughout this community and around the world. Forgive our sins in Christ's name and amen. Say again that it is very good to have each of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, I invite you back anytime that you're able to be with us. Before we're led in a closing prayer, let's sing 860, He is my everything. And let's stand, please. He is my everything. Please bow. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us to come here together as a church family and worship you and fellowship with one another. Please be with the elders of the congregation as they continue to make decisions and lead our, our church family. And please be with us as we leave today and continue to uh, run our Christian race and guide us as we lay down our burdens and refocus on you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All righty. It is time to get going, I believe. We, we can get all the riffraff out of here, all the hoodlums. We do have some new books uh, that we've gotten in. If you don't have a book, or if you've left yours at home, if you're visiting, you want a book, find and get one. If you anticipate only being here this morning, feel free to leave it behind and all. But did get the uh, get them swapped out. I don't know. Last week we had a few uh, that were part one of the series instead of part two. We got those swapped out. So Anthony has a few here. If you raise your hand, he has some. If you need any. All right. So we are still then in uh, 2 Thessalonians. Only three chapters in 2 Thessalonians, but we started it last week and on chapter 2 this week. And a fair amount of stuff in uh, chapter 2 that we want to look at. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started looking at that. A uh, number of different, different things in it. Let me get my Bible turned to it. It's Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians... All right, so Paul starts, you know, I guess we just get on into it, like I said, a good bit to go over in this, uh, but Paul starts and kind of introduces what, what he intends to talk about or some, some thoughts before he gets into or as he gets into what he wants to talk about there in the first couple of verses. And he says there in uh, the first two verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So Paul's already kind of talked some about the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord and all. We spent uh, two or three weeks ago... Looking at chapters 4 and 5 of his first letter, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, we talked about the coming of the Lord. They had expressed some concerns about uh, those who had already died. What's going to happen with those who have already died? Um, are they going to be saved? Are they, they, are they going to get to go? Is there going to be some advantage to us being alive and all that jazz? Talked about that in 1 Thessalonians. So we, so we looked at that and, and Paul has addressed that. But here now he says uh, that we don't want you to be quickly shaken from your composure regardless of how you hear it. To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. They've apparently either from maybe what Paul has said in the past or they've received some, some word from, from some, some false teachers intentionally or unintentionally. Um, either in person or by letter or whatever it may be, something that has created some confusion in their minds about whether or not the day of the Lord has yet come. Um, so this is kind of uh, what they would, what, what Paul wants to address, and it's really the bulk of what he does address here in Second uh, Thessalonians. Like I said, it's only three chapters, and this chapter two is 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 the bulk of what he wants to talk about. He goes into a few things separate in, in chapter three, but but this is really the bulk of it. And uh, he says that uh, in, in, in verse 2, you yourselves, or, or, or you may remember, when we, when we looked at 1 Thessalonians, and he was talking about uh, how you know, the, the coming of the day of the Lord, he said in chapter 5, verse 2, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Well, how did they know that? Well, probably because Paul and Silas and Timothy talked about it while they were in Thessalonica, one of the, one of the sermons, you know, one of the lessons or one of the discussions that they had with the Christians there in Thessalonica, it's something they talked about. So he was able to say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. Um, here in chapter 2 of our study, he addresses some more issues, as I say, regarding the come of Christ. And he says in verse 5, he says, uh, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? So this is more of, of what they've talked about while he was there, or while they were there. It's a discussion they had while, while they were there. But now, apparently something has come up where Paul has said, okay, now, now keep in mind, guys, here's, here's what I need you to focus on. Just like he did in his first letter in, verses, in chapters 4 and 5, 
Uh, he's doing it with a slightly different topic than here in his second letter, uh, chapter 2. So here in verses 1 and 2, then he encourages them to not be quickly shaken from their composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter from us. Uh, don't be so quickly shaken. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not so much an idea of... Uh, of, of quickness or um, um, sort of, they had visited Thessalon uh, Thessalonica, and it's not a matter of how, uh, within just a few weeks, they'd already turned their backs. Uh, Paul mentions this to the Galatians, you know, oh, Galatians, who, who has so quickly changed your minds? Who, is, who has so quickly uh, convinced you or, or led you astray on the things we taught you? That was... We're here, we talk, we turn our backs, and all of a sudden you've already walked off the, the, the path and you're thinking something else. It's a matter of, of how long did it take before they got confused. That's not so much what this is when he says, do not be quickly shaken. Um, but Paul wrote to Timothy in verse 22 of, of his first letter, uh, to avoid laying hands on anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. It's a matter of, be sure you know what you're doing before you lay hands on somebody, before you get on to somebody. Don't, don't jump to conclusions on that. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here in 2 Thessalonians when he says to not be quickly shaken. Uh, be sure of what you're thinking about. Remember the things that, that we, we talked about while we were there. Remember the things that we talked about in our last letter to you. Consider all the things you have related to what we've communicated to you before you say, oh my goodness, has the Lord already come? Is this the day of the Lord already? Are we already here? Settle down and, and keep in mind what we've talked about. Uh, and I, I think it's a decent message to us whenever things come up to us. What about this? Oh, my. Settle down. What, what do we know about it? What do you know about the problem? What have we, what have we learned from, from our studies up to this point? And apply it as opposed to just immediately jumping to it. But he says, do not be so quickly shaken from your composure uh, as to be disturbed either by spirit, message, or letter as if from us. Um, by spirit, whether it be some divine revelation that, that they had received, right or wrong, maybe they didn't hear it right, whatever it may be. We know that there certainly were a number of gifts uh, that existed uh, at that time. But uh, John encouraged his readers in chapter 4 of his first letter, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Paul says, you know, don't be so quickly shaken. If you hear something that confuses you or that seems contrary to what we've talked about, if it's by spirit, you know, if, if, if by that manner you hear something, think about it. How does it compare to what we've given you? Uh, what other information do you have related to it? By spirit or by message, whether it's somebody who has walked into the assembly and said, you know, or just friends, goodness knows we hear all the time different ideas or we read different ideas in, in, in the news or, or different books written or whatever uh, about how things will be and all. It's, if somebody comes in the assembly or you're just sitting there uh, during lunch break and somebody says, yeah, well, you know, I think uh, there's this thing called premillennialism or <laughs> whatever they come up with if you hear it by word if you get it by spirit or if it by some letter as if from us uh, kind of a curious little note but uh, suggesting the idea perhaps that that somebody had written them a you know, letter you know hey, welcome we appreciate all this that and the other here's some sideways information on the coming of the Lord the day of the Lord's already here uh, and and signing it with Paul's name or implying that it's Paul or implying they were with Paul or, or, or who knows. But regardless of how you receive this information, uh, don't be so easily shaken as it relates to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Regarding the day of the Lord, we've talked about this is what he's saying to them. We've talked about this. We talked about it some in my first letter. We spent four days, you know, while Paul, Silas, and Timothy were there. Uh, while we were there, um, we talked about this. So don't be so easily shaken, regardless of what medium that information comes from. Take a moment, take a breath, and, and, and uh, consider what information you have. Don't be so quickly shaken. Uh, and the issue that Paul is addressing, some concerned that, as I say, they had apparently received from some source that said the day of the Lord has come. Or some versions say the day of the Lord is already here. And on one hand you think the day of the Lord, of course it hasn't come, we're still alive. Well, that, if you say of course the day of the Lord has not come yet because we're already alive, it, it certainly indicates a, a, an understanding of what the day of the Lord is or when the day of the Lord will come or if it has come. 
We can say, well, of course it hasn't come. We're still here. Because when it comes, it's all over. And, and I think we pretty easily agree on that. But depending on how people look at things and depending on the times, especially these times, um, and the maturity level of the folks, they may not necessarily have that understanding that, well, of course he's not come. Uh, it, it, it's obvious that the birds are still flying and everything, that the world has not been destroyed. Um, but if you think about it too, God's intent from the earliest of time, uh, ever since sin entered the world, ever since sin entered the world, God's intent was to reestablish that relationship with mankind that he had before sin entered the world. And we know from that moment forward, and, and we know this because we have the whole gospel before us, we know from that point forward, he set into motion a whole lot of things that led to reestablishing that, that, that uh, relationship that he had with mankind. And we see all the different things that took place in the Old Testament, and we see that they were leading up to the coming of Christ, the coming of our, our, our Lord. Uh, once Jesus came then that's a major stepping stone in the progress of what God has in mind of how he's going to do things. And somebody might say, oh, okay, day of the Lord's here now. We're, 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 we're fixing to wrap things up. Well, we know that, no, not yet. Yes, that was a big deal, but we're going to wrap things up. Okay, he, is, he lives his life, he teaches, he's crucified, he's raised from the dead. All right, we're here now. Well, we know, no, we're not here yet. The, the church hadn't even been established at that point yet. So no, no, we're not the yet. Yes, it's a big step. Yes, it's a big sign. Once the church is established, oh, we're here now. Hold up, not yet. And, and we see certainly a number of different statements that are made that says you know, the, time is, the time is drawing near. Jesus said it himself while he was here. The apostles said it multiple times uh, in, in their different letters. So yes, the day of the Lord is very much, it's here, it's near, it's, it's, it's among. We're, we're in that last dispensation where, yeah, we're, we're, we're headed there. But Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Oh, okay, well, we're here. No, we're not there yet. And so I think we can get, knowing all of that, we, we can see in our minds how, how somebody says the day of the Lord is here. Where one person might say, well, no, it's not. Another person, well, yeah, kind of it is. Well, it kind of depends on how you call it. We use the day of the Lord in so many different ways. And certainly at this time, as they're trying to figure these things out, as different messages keep coming through, they're extremely young in their faith. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had just been up there for a short period before they, had to, before they got run out. Um, so you can see where they would have some confusion about the day of the Lord. Is it already here? Has it already come? Are we, you know, even in our world today, what was it, the, uh, the left behind books? Wasn't that just a big, uh, a whole lot of, you know, and, and we hear jokes of, well, has the rapture happened? What's going on? Where is everybody? Did I get left behind? Type concept mentality, which, you know, you think of it from a scriptural standpoint, and you say, well, that's silly. That, that, that's not the way it works. But especially with these guys at their age and, and, and their maturity level, I can, I can very much see where they would be somewhat confused about it and, and, and have that opinion. But Paul and, and, and the primary message here in chapter 2 to them is the day of the Lord has not yet come. As a matter of fact, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so forth, there are some clear indications here for you guys that let you know that, well, that's silly. Of course he hasn't come. And, and that's what we'll look at then, then this morning. Some of those things related to that. Uh, in verses 3 through 12, he says, this is how you can know the day of the Lord has not come. So up to this point then, any, any thoughts or comments or, or anything related to that? All right then, verses 3 through 12, or at least starting in through some of that, he says here, starting in verse 3, basically, here's how you can know the day of the Lord has not yet come. Let me turn the page here to verse 3. Here's how you can know the day of the Lord has not yet come. In verses 3 and 4 he says, Let no man or let no one in any way deceive you, for it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Mr. and Miss Thessalonians, the apostasy has to come first and the man of lawlessness has to come. Who is the man of destruction? Since, they haven't, since, that, hasn't hap since that hasn't happened... The day of the Lord obviously has not come. Now for us and me and, and maybe you guys do, some of you guys may be smarter than I am. But for me, I say, what? The apostle, the man of law, 
because of this, this is the evidence that the Lord hasn't come. I don't even know what this means. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I know in my mind, especially when I started looking at this, started looking at what is meant by this. And, and, and honestly, one of the things that I did in trying to seek some of the stuff out, I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to look and, and I'm going to see what different ideas, different people have, you know, different uh, commentators, some, some smart, respected people that, 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 that we've had speak for us before. What do, what do they say on what this is? Because my intent was figure this out so that we can say, all right, so this apostasy, man of lawlessness, and so forth, um, what, what, is, what is that? As I said, you, some of you may know, is anybody wants to talk and, and explain what the, that apostasy and man of lawlessness is that, that has to happen before the day the Lord comes? Yeah, I didn't think so. Neither do I. <laughs> no, it's in a way it's 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 not that bad, especially when when you start off from from the perspective or, or the understanding that we don't know, we really don't know. You know, we we know, and and, and we even talk either in classes or for sermons and so forth. You will hear statements of we don't know the whole story of what all Jesus said here. Uh, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, we don't know what all they talked about, but obviously they came to this conclusion. Yeah, we say that all the time. And this is very much one that not only do we not know what all is being said here, but a big factor related to that is we don't know what Paul and Silas and Timothy talked to the Thessalonians about related to the apostasy and the man of lawlessness while they were there. It's pretty obvious that they had a discussion related to that and the Thessalonians understood what was being talked about. Even if it was somewhat cryptic, even if it was somewhat uh, difficult to understand, they understood it so that Paul could here say something as, as, as vague as, uh, let no one in any way deceive you for the, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. To that they could say, well, yeah, he has a good point there. Whereas to me, I say, huh? Because it's like, what, are you, what are you talking about? Um, so, like I said, I started out saying, so I'm going to figure this out. I'm, I'm going to get all these opinions and, and see what seems to make good sense. And it, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It was difficult. But I did see one statement made, and, and, and I changed my approach when I saw this. Uh, one statement that was made by Augustine. We've heard the name Augustine. I've heard it, and, but I couldn't really tell you much about him unless... I looked it up again this week to see about it. Augustine, great philosopher from the 5th century, 4th century, writer, early uh, philosopher, uh, one of the early church fathers, he, a little bit sideways on a lot of the things that he believed. I think John Calvin actually based a lot of his ideas on some of the things Augustine says. So obviously uh, off base on a few things, um, but extremely well-studied individual. Many, many, many more times than, than I could even imagine being uh, as far as studying uh, scripture and, and, and religion and so forth. But Augustine said in uh, his book called The City of God, some philosophical writing that he did, The City of God, he referenced some of Paul's writings in, in, in this passage and said, I admit the meaning of this completely escapes me. Well, guess what? <laughs> I'm not even going to try. No, I did try, and, and we can try. But somebody who is that enormously studied, if they're willing to say, I'm not sure what Paul's saying here. I'm not sure what he's referring to, in very large part because he's referencing things that they did understand and we don't so much. So I kind of changed my approach and said, okay, maybe what I'll do is just try to figure out as best I can what the different bits and pieces are and, 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 and present some of that. To, to at least give us an idea of that while keeping in mind the, the real emphasis behind what Paul's trying to communicate to them. And that is the day of the Lord has not come. The day of the Lord has not yet come because there are a number of things that have to take place before that day of the Lord comes. So don't worry about it. And that's the real message. If, if we get that out of it, we get the message of Paul here without knowing so, well, now exactly what is this or, or how does that work and so forth. So um, anyway... Took a little bit of different approach uh, related to things after, after seeing that and, and refocused my idea. But uh, we'll look at it from that perspective unless somebody has some great explanation as, as to <laughs> what, it, what it is. I don't think, regardless of what a person's explanation would may be, uh, I'm not sure they can know, but eh, whatever. We'll look at it though. So, uh, the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Uh, before the, the, the apostasy comes, some versions may say the day, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. 
But uh, either way, that the term of, of, of the apostasy or the falling away, it's typically more of a, of a military type of term um, related to uh, turning away from or, or, or backing away from and so forth. But, uh, and, and whether that be a, a somebody that you're in battle with or a, the civil laws, the, the, the civil laws that exist to, to uh, manage society, you know, turning away from those things. Uh, we certainly have the law of God, and, and then the law of God is much greater than, than any law of the land and all. And I can certainly see, and, and, and here it's referenced the idea, that what Paul is talking about is a rebellion or a turning away from the law of God. I was like, well, that makes sense. That's, that's not too, too difficult. Uh, and apparently the words that he uses here, the Greek words that are there in our the idea of turning away are more than just a matter of, you remember in uh, Revelation uh, where Paul addresses the church, church in Ephesus, you've lost your, you've, you've lost your first love. You, you, you are no longer for, focused on, on your first love there, you, leaving your first love. That's sort of a turning away, but apparently the, the words and phrases and tenses and all that jazz, they get used here where he says that uh, there will be an apostasy is more than just that level of turning away. It's a, it's a full out turning your back on. I want nothing to do with it. Anything uh, religious wise, uh, anything, anything has anything to do with God, I'm turning away from that. I, I, I want nothing to do with that. Uh, and even the suggestions made that it has something to do not only turning back on God, but even civil laws as well. Anything that has anything to do with laws is like, Psh, I'm doing what I want. I don't care about anybody, anything. And it's not just a lot of people. It's a, a, a mass chunk of people. I picture what we saw in the days of Noah where God was, was looking over everything before he gave Noah the commission to build the ark. And he said that every, every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only continually evil. And that's kind of the impression that I get is that every intent of everything, I mean, it was just, it, it was evil. It was a mess. And as we see the man of lawlessness described here in chapter 2, I think we see that that's very much what he or it or whatever it is intends is just complete anarchy, complete, complete mess uh, related to the law of God, the law of lands or, or, or anything else. So that's what we see. That has to come first. Now we see even in our time, oh, things are pretty rough. Uh, we could compare maybe how bad they are now as compared to other times and so forth. Uh, but as we looked at in chapters 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians, Paul's intent is not to give a schedule of events so that we can check off. Have we gotten this one yet? Uh, no, I don't think the apostasy is here yet. Let's give it a little bit more time before we check that one off. That's, that's not, again, what Paul's doing. His emphasis is just saying these haven't happened yet, so you can know. The day of the Lord has not yet come. Um, so, additionally, before the day of the Lord comes, verse 3, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Uh, your version may say uh, the uh, man of sin is, is some of the versions. Um, up until just, well, I don't know how long ago. I didn't look at how long ago. Some of the older versions a lot of times will say man of sin, uh, based, I think, primarily on what was available in some of the original texts that had man of sin basically there. Uh, some of the texts that have been found since have man of lawlessness. Uh, you can imagine, they're, they're, they're both the same type of thing. It, if somebody is completely without law or, or has no regard for the law of God, well, they are of sin. I mean, that's going to go together. Uh, but apparently some of the more accurate uh, readings from, from what most people see on all that's available and what it should be is uh, man of lawlessness. So, and that's fine either way. I think the King James Version, New King James Version, American Standard Version, they had man of sin, but the majority of, of, of the uh, translations, translations, the uh, uh, versions of the Bible that I looked at, and you can find so many things so quickly, 20, 25 different versions had man of lawlessness, whereas there were just three or four that were, were, were man of sin. But either way, uh, man of lawlessness apparently comes closer. Here in verses 7 and 8, they mention lawlessness again. Even some of the versions that say man of sin in verses 7 and 8, they say, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and then that lawless one will be revealed, referencing the same type of thing. So more more credibility to the idea that maybe lawlessness makes more sense than sin there. But either way, before the day of the Lord comes, the apostasy must come first and the man of lawless, lawlessness must be revealed. Uh, and a few, points, uh, a few points related to that, 
the apostasy and the man of lawlessness. Paul uses for both of those the article the, T-H-E, the apostasy and the man of lawlessness, indicating apparently that it's not just a general conceptual type of apostasy, uh, in theory apostasy, or in theory a man of laws. It's something specific, something specific that existed, the apostasy and the man of lawlessness, and again, something that they would have been familiar with, something they would have already uh, known about. Um, so as, as Paul brings these things to them, as we kind of said, it's not new news to them. He's, he's referencing something that they'd already talked about uh, before. Um, we also see here that the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Um, and verse 7 says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This man of lawlessness, whatever it is, already exists at the time that he is writing this to the Thessalonians, but it has not yet been completely revealed. So to the Thessalonians, it would be a matter of saying, the man of lawlessness thing that we talked about when we were there, he hasn't come yet. Therefore, the day of the Lord could not have come yet. One of these days, this man of lawlessness is going to be fully revealed. I know we talked about it. I know you, you, you have an idea and stuff, but he has not yet been fully revealed. There's going to come a time when this thing being called the man of lawlessness that we don't have much of an idea about um, is going to be fully revealed and it will and it'll be kind of an eye opening type of thing. And even that, I think we can see we know there are mysteries that that are beyond the reach of, of our little brains, that one day will be revealed. One day when Christ comes again, there'll be a big, oh, oh, okay, yeah, oh, that makes sense now. And that man of lawlessness is one of those things that will be revealed in its, in its existence and what it is and to the extent to what it is and all, one of these days, but it has not yet been revealed. To the Thessalonians and to us, uh, we know that there is this thing that has not yet been fully revealed, but it's one of these days, uh, perhaps, or it, it apparently will be. Uh, day of the Lord will not come until it's fully revealed. Uh, and the intent before getting sideways on, well, then what is it? Well, what will it be when it's revealed? Well, what if we don't know it all yet, but we know a little bit of it, what do we know right now? That's not the message. That's not what Paul's trying to communicate. Paul's trying to communicate is the day of the Lord has not yet come. It's what they need to fully understand, even though they know a little bit more about it, and, and, and what we need to understand. Uh, so at the end of verse 3 then, we see that the man of lawlessness is also called the son of destruction. Again, some versions may say son of perdition. Same type of thing. Perdition is that eternally state of, eternal late state of loss. Completely lost, fully forevermore lost, son of destruction, that's, that's pretty obvious. But this son or man of lawlessness is the son of destruction or, or son of, of, of prediction. Uh, apparently the, the word that gets used there is kind of a, a, an idiom for one appointed for destruction. Okay, sounds good. Use destruction, use uh, perdition, whatever works there. Uh, Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, I guarded them and not one of them perished but the son of perdition referring to Judas, is what Jesus called uh, him there. So uh, perdition, eternal state of judgment and, and, and all. And the man of law, lawlessness is clearly one who is slated for eternal punishment, eternal destruction. That's what's going to happen. So he hasn't come yet because these two things need to happen, one of which is the man of lawlessness, who is also called the son of perdition because that's what his final state's going to be. Don't worry about him. He's going to be taken care of. So uh, at least a few things about him, and, and there's more to be learned about in his character as, as we look at the verses under this, but any thoughts or questions or, or, or comments, suggestions uh, related to this? That was a lot, and you think, wow, what do he say? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, some of the, there's an enormous number of suggestions from uh, the man of lawlessness is the Roman government as a whole. The man of lawlessness is Nero uh, during that time. The man of lawlessness is the Pope and all succeeding popes since then. The man of lawlessness is the Catholic Church as a whole. The man of lawlessness is Martin Luther. I mean, lots of different antichrists that we read about. And, and another one of those terms that we say exactly what's being referred to there. Uh, but a number of different people, uh, the Tsar of Russia, the President of the United States, <laughs> you know, uh, that's the man of lawlessness. We are in the final times, folks. Now, stop. 
exactly what Paul's saying is no. He hasn't been fully, fully revealed. You don't know what it is yet. But there have been, and I think Ron may have mentioned when we were talking about it, that Alexander Campbell, maybe, don't quote me, I, I think maybe he ha his, his, his thought on it was that it referred to the Catholic Church. Uh, Wayne Jackson looked at a lot of his stuff and he's very adamant. He says, absolutely, it's the Catholic Church. And he lays out some logical ideas that say, well, yeah, I can see that. Well, yeah, I can see that. Lots of things that make sense. But then some where you say, well, now, wait a second. I, but what about this? I don't know that this, that doesn't make good sense. And, and it's what I kept running into <laughs> trying to figure this thing out. But lots of different ideas and opinions related to who this man of lawlessness is. Uh, a lot of them. And at the end of the day, and, and that's when I really got it with Augustine saying, I have no idea what Paul's saying here. <laughs> it's like, well, guess what? I'm not going to try that hard either because I don't believe I can. So many different ideas, but it's, it's hard to say. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that, is a, that is a real, that is a real possibility. But like you said, there's plenty. There's plenty. Plenty. Yeah. And folks like this may have at this time been on the minds of the Thessalonians because this was written right around 51, 52 AD. We heard all this stuff going on, this, this, this being in power. And I think he was maybe the one who was threatening to put a statue of himself in the, inside the temple. Maybe, yes, I mean, and that to uh, a, a Jew or, or to anybody who says this is important to me religiously, they're going to do this. What are you doing? And it just really he harassed them a lot. And he's one, like I said, Nero, all of them. And to me, it's like, well, if we're talking about an individual, the man of lawlessness for us has not yet come and will be fully revealed. He's dead. That doesn't make good sense. Just, every time we come up with, with, with an idea for here's an idea, here's a, a suggestion, here's a possibility, there are things that say, I don't know, that, that doesn't make good sense to me. It doesn't add up. So, yeah, he was, he was another one. Oh, there are lots, lots of ideas. So, anyway. Other questions, thoughts, ideas, th things that you've heard and, and seen or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Are we at any great loss because we don't know exactly what this man of loss is? Pfft, no. Are we at any kind of loss to not heed what he kind of wraps this up with in talking with the Thessalonians and saying, don't worry about it. I know you're being harassed a lot, but God rules over all. Yeah, we're at a loss if we don't know that because that's what matters. That's what we have to keep in mind. We may not be harassed like the Thessalonians were harassed, but we put up with things and, and we have our own struggles and we have difficulties. So at the end of the day, what matters? What the man of lawlessness is called or what Paul is trying to communicate to the Thessalonians and to us? And that's what really matters. So yeah, that, that's, that's what really matters. All right, well, looking then at some of the other things that, that we see about this man of lawlessness, just so we can, we can have some more information about what, what is said about him. Uh, we see there in verse 4, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. That in and of itself is a lot of stuff that makes you say, well, that doesn't sound very smart. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what this man of lawlessness has in mind. It's what he has plans. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. 
and, and the magnitude of his plans uh, are, are somewhat, like, somewhat like what we see in Daniel's visions in Daniel chapter 7. And he talked about the fourth beast of, uh, among all the different visions he had there. And he said, he shall speak words against the Most High and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time. Same type of concept, maybe some of the same types of things being referenced as Paul had whatever discussions he had with the Thessalonians. But the intent of the man of lawlessness will be head cheese of all cheeses. When it comes to religion and worshiping and stuff, it's me right here. Nothing else, uh, no one else. And the words that are used for, for above every so-called God or object of worship was apparently a rare word that doesn't get used much, but it means anything, whether it be gods or temples or idols or uh, different images, uh, priests or uh, anything that had anything to do with worship, I am above it all. I am completely top dog. That's where his intent is. That's what he, he intends. Again, doesn't sound very smart, but... That's where he's headed. Um, several other attributes about the man of lawlessness there. Verses 9 and 10 say, the one, who, the one who's coming, this man of lawlessness, is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love and the truth to be saved. Uh, this man of lawlessness is a wreck. He 100%. He wants 100% all contrary to God. I want everything to me. He is nothing. God is nothing. God and any gods and any things related to gods, uh, they are nothing. I am God. I am sitting. I'll sit in the seat. Uh, verse 4 says, take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. That's what his intent is. That's where he's headed. Are we there yet today? Well, no. A lot of crazy stuff in our world today, but you know, are we there? Well, no. And, and Paul says, no, you're not there. The man of lawlessness has not come. The apostasy has not come. So, of course, the day of the Lord is not yet here. Uh, he'll have a lot of followers, and those two will be destroyed, unfortunately. So, a bit of a word to say, it hasn't happened yet. Here's how you can know it hasn't happened yet. And let me describe some things about this guy, this, this man of lawlessness thing and then the apostasy that is to come. And, uh, and mentioning verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. All right, there's your another. Who is it that restrains the man of lawlessness? Lots of ideas again. My first thought when I thought, okay, well, that's obviously, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, and so forth, that is restraining him for a time. And that seemed real logical. <laughs> Except you have the mystery of lawlessness if you say it's God. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only God restrains and will do so until he's taken out of the way. Well, no, that doesn't quite fly. Well, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's restraining him, and God will say, all right, let, let's let him go and let him be revealed. Uh, maybe. That sounds a little bit odd. So many things, again, we don't know. And this is the specific verse that Augustus said, I have no idea what Paul is saying here with this revealed thing. So again, another thing you put over in a category of, I don't know, what's the main message Paul's trying to get across? <laughs> and go back to that. And, and that's very much then, then what matters is, is the main message. So we have then verses 7 and 8. Looking at those together, we say, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. For all his positioning and all his grandeur and all his pump and all his I'm going to be the this and this and this, what's going to be the end result of him? Nothing. When the Lord comes again, the Lord will slay. And how will he slay him? You know, in Revelation, we see this enormous battle take place. And again, that's more for, for theatrics and creating movies than anything. It, 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 it gives us information, but it's all apocalyptic stuff. Here, Paul says, the, the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. The man of law just shows up and the Lord says, and he's done. That's it. Next. And that's what Paul wants to communicate to them. 
the things that we talked about, the things that, 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 are, that are harassing you, and I know that you're, being, you're going through all kinds of tribulations, but they will pass. God is in control, and when he comes again, he's going to put everything into its place. The man of lawlessness will be gone at his breath, and it's not going to be some big terrible struggle that God has with this man of lawlessness who is absolutely falling in the steps of Satan, as we see here. But God, my friends, is in charge. Don't worry about it. Keep that in mind. Don't make your list of what's happening and when. You have work to do. We have work to do. Focus on the work to be done. He's already complimented them at all the great things he does. And in chapter 3, he'll kind of get back to them, that and talk about how you got, you're doing a great job. I so appreciate all the work that you're doing. Regarding this, don't worry about that. The day of the Lord has not come. It's obvious he hasn't come because of these two things we talked about. Um, and, and even when it does happen, psh, God's going to take care of that. You guys are okay. We're all okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, you just do the work that you need to do. So he's in charge. Um, we talked about last week related to some of the things that were talked about in, in, in well, in chapter 1, really, of, of 2 Thessalonians. But Paul's statements, he said that their sufferings were a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that they would be considered worthy the kingdom of God for which indeed they were suffering. Talked about that verse and the fact that you know, there's a reason for these things happening. He says here in this chapter, related to all this that he's talked about, he says the man of lawlessness and all his or its plans and, and, and deeds and so forth. He says in verse 14, it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught, whether by word or mouth or letter from us. The day of the Lord hasn't come. Lots of problems, but don't worry about it. God's got it in his control, and when it does come, he'll take care of it, and who cares? It's not your problem. Don't worry about it. We're okay. And that's the message that he wants to get to, to them and to us, so that we don't get too wrapped up and say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Don't worry about it. it. That part doesn't matter so much. What matters is God's in control. As we go through our lives and as we go through our struggles and we go through our doubts or whatever it may be, well, okay, that happens. Stand fast, stand strong. The day of the Lord will come and he'll take care of business. For now, leave it up to him. You do what I've complimented you so much already on, on, on what you do. So, Comments, thoughts, and, and so forth on that. A lot of neat kind of good stuff. Uh, I'll tell you, honestly, trying to put this together wore me out. I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know what. And partly because, I, all right, I'm going to figure this out. No, you're not. <laughs> you are not. You're going to waste some time trying to figure this out. But anyway, thoughts, comments. All right, then. I heard the first bell there. Uh, as I said, we do have extra books, so if you do need some, you're welcome to those. And uh, we then will look at chapter 3 next week. Uh, before we go, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, God, we do thank you once again for this day of life that you've given us and the many blessings that we have in this day. God, we thank you so much for your word and the encouragement that we get from your word. Help us, God, to keep our minds focused on what you say to us and what you have to give to us in encouragement and, and to, to build our faith up and stand fast with you. So many different things that, that so many people deal with, God, at, at, at so many different levels. Help us, Father, to focus our, our strength and our faith and our encouragement on on you and the fact that you are in charge and you will take care of us as you've promised so many times. God, we ask that you would be with us as we dismiss from here. Uh, keep us safe until the next time we come together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate all the comments.